Good morning, everyone. My name is Demita Brown. I am the Director and Chief Diversity Officer for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and we are excited to partner with the Department of Finance and Management and our pre-qualifications manager, Bianca Bell, to deliver a training on our pre-qualifications process. Um, as many of you likely know, with the disparity study implementation, there were a number of changes that took place uh, with respect to our, not only our MBE program, but also the pre-qualification. And so in partnership with council, we wanted to make sure that our vendor community was aware of the changes and had the necessary support in order to be successful uh, with respect to your pre-qualification process. With that, I'll turn it over to Bianca Bell, the expert guru in pre-qualification, um, who will give us a dynamic presentation about pre-qualification and answer some of those most commonly asked questions. So, Bianca. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my, as, again, my name is Bianca Bell. I am the Management Analyst 2 for the Office of Construction Pre-Qualification. I am the person who will Get your application, I'll review it, I'll send out um, any correspondence that comes from the office will come directly um, for me. Um, and when you have questions and you call or you email, I'm the person who will respond. So today we're going to talk about construction pre-qualification, what it is, um, what it entails. We're actually going to go through the application um, step by step and answer any questions that you may have regarding what pre-qualification is, the process, how we make the determination um, if you're an eligible business. So today we're going to talk about what is pre-qualification, the effective date of pre-qualification, who needs to be pre-qualified, and then we're going to go through the application process, the submission of the application, how it's evaluated and scored, the status determination, and then how you renew your application. And also some good tips to remember when completing your application. So what is pre-qualification? It's a biannual uniform process for evaluating potential bidders and subcontractors. So pre-qualification um, used to be something that was renewed annually. Um, it is now, as of uh, January, 1st, 20, uh, January 1, 2022, um, it's a biannual process every other year. Pre-qualification of potential bidders and subcontractors is a separate process from the bid evaluation process. Um, some people think that they're one and the same. They are not. The pre-qualification needs to be done in order for you to be eligible for, for the bid. So if your bid says construction pre-qualification is needed, you would need to come through this office prior and be approved prior to submitting a bid. Is it the, the vendor's portal? Pre-qualification? Yeah. No, pre-qualification is not in the vendor portal. Um, it is um, a separate office, um, all of its own. You'll have um, in an application, it has the email address that you can uh, send your application to a fax number where you can fax it, um, but it is not housed in the uh, vendor services portal. And I did just shut us off. Hold on for a second. <laughs> um, and pre-qualification is also separate from contract compliance. Um, I get that call a lot. Hey, they say I need my contract compliance number. Uh, I don't have it, but you know who has it? The Office of Diversity and Inclusion has it for you. So anytime you need your, and I will if you happen to call because you forget, I will direct you to the Office um, of Diversity and Inclusion um, to get that contract compliance number. So pursuant to Section 329.21G, only potential bidders pre-qualify responsible or provisionally responsible may be awarded a contract for city construction service. And so we'll talk about how to get to responsible and pro provisionally responsible later on in the presentation. Only licensed construction trade subcontractors pre-qualified responsible or pre-qualified provisionally responsible may subcontract or perform on city construction service work. 
So we'll talk about which subcontractors um, need to be pre-qualified because not all of the subcontractors have to go through the pre-qualification process. So during the presentation, we'll specifically point out which of the trades need to be pre-qualified to perform work. No business entity deemed pre-qualified not responsible can perform work on city construction projects. So who needs to be pre-qualified? Potential bidders. Simple, if you want to bid on a construction service project, you need to be pre-qualified. The following license construction trade subcontractors are the only subcontractors that need to be pre-qualified. That's your heating, your ventilating and air conditioning, refrigeration, electrical, plumbing, hydronics, and fire protection, and firefighting equipment. Again, these are the only subcontractors that need to be pre-qualified to do work on construction service projects. Remember, pre-qualification is only for construction service work, nothing else. So now we're going to go through the construction pre-qualification application process. This is the fun part. So we're going to review the application. So if you flip through your application, there's a contact information page. For the contact informa information page, complete it in its entirety. The more information that you provide, the better it will be. It contains a person that, um, who owns the company, your fiscal year, um, the address, different contact information, phone number, address, and things like that. So please complete it in its entirety. The contact name should be the person who's going to respond to any correspondence that comes from the Office of Construction Prequalification. I normally do correspondence through email because, you know, we're a virtual world now. Everybody has email on their phone. Everybody's on the go. But your contact person should be the person who's always in the inbox looking for new emails because the emails that I send are time sensitive. Um, I only give a few days. If I don't hear back, then I continue on with the evaluation process. Check the appropriate request box. So it'll ask you, do you want to be a potential bidder or do you want to do a subcontractor work only? If at any time you feel that you would want to bid on a project, just check the potential bidder box, you can always be a subcontractor. Um, there are some companies that strictly want to do subcontract work, um, and we do differentiate that when we do send out information. So if you want to do both, that's fine, but pick the potential bidder. The submission of an application. Applications are accepted year-round, January, December. You just don't take any days off. <laughs> um, and so when you decide to, to go through the process, once you're issued a status determination, you want to make sure that you renew your application dur during the renewal period that will be listed on your certificate when you receive it. You can fax your application to 614-645. 5818, and it actually faxes into um, an email account, or you can email it to prequalification at columbus.gov, which is also the same email address that you would send uh, any questions that you have. Applications are only taken by fax or email. Um, prime example why the shutdown that recently happened I was still able to process applications because people were emailing them or faxing them in. Um, so it is very helpful, and we do save some trees this way. You can download the application at, the, at our website at www.columbus.gov slash prequalification dot A, S as in Sam, P, X. When you submit your application, you will receive an email saying that your application has been received, and you will have seven business days from the date that your application is received to make any changes you want to the application. If you forgot to submit documentation, if you submit the incorrect documentation, 
we give you seven business days from the date that we receive the application to say, hey, I need to change this about my application. No questions asked. Now to the evaluation and scoring of the application. So the application is broken into categories. We have category A, category B, and category C. So category A consists of criteria numbered one through six. All six criteria in this category must be met. To meet the criteria, you have to mark true and or check any appropriate exemption boxes and submit the appropriate criteria, document, supported documentation for the criteria. Failure to provide the correct documentation or checking false will automatically make you deemed pre-qualified not responsible. So criteria one is dealing with workers' compensation. What do I need for support? I need a current copy of your BWC certificate or the certificate of employer's right to pay compensation directly if you're self-assured. Expired certificates will not be accepted, of course. And the records of payment of workers' compensation benefits will not be accepted. Criteria two is your unemployment compensation policy. The documentation that you need to provide is payments applied to quarter from the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services through your online account with them. Or that you can provide a letter from the Ohio Department of Job and Family Services that states that you have no outstanding liabilities or filings with their office, and that letter must be dated within 30 days of the date of submission of your application. If you're an out-of-state applicant, not only are you required to provide one of the documentations referenced above, but you must also provide documentation from your state saying that you have no outstanding um, liabilities with their unemployment office as well. Um, your copies of your liability insurance is not um, an acceptable piece of documentation to submit. We get them all the time, but it's, it's not what is required for proof. Criteria three is about bonding. We need the notarized bonding affidavit, which is found in the back of the application, so it's already there for you. And a notarized letter from your surety company that is signed by the surety company's attorney in fact, and the attorney in fact signature is notarized, states that you, the applicant, is current and have um, available bonding capacity this letter cannot be dated more than 30 days from the submission of your application, and you must also include the surety company's power of attorney page. Um, if anything, that's the, most, the thing that's missing the most is the power of attorney page, so you want to make sure um, not to delay the process of your application that that page is included. Please do not have your um, affidavits notarized by spouses or family members. Um, they will not be accepted. Um, I will send you an email and say, I've attached the affidavit. The affidavit was signed. Clearly, it looked like by a family member. Or, or, so please you know, have someone else notarize your affidavit. So criteria four is financial statements, and criteria five is debarment. So basically, we want to know if for any reason we need to look at your financial statements, can we do that? Um, and then we want to know, are you currently debarred from any projects? Um, <laughs> that's definitely something that we want to know. So with that, we'll take the notarized application affidavit, which is also found in the back of the application. And again, you'll see this reminder throughout the presentation not to have spouses or family members uh, notarize your affidavits. So as you can see in this, these particular criteria, I didn't ask for anything additional because nothing additional is required. Um, you're just saying, I'm truthfully saying 
that I'm not debarred from any current projects, or if for some reason the city needs to see my financial statements, I'm willing to let someone come in and review. Criteria six, which is the last criteria in category A, has to do with city taxes. You will need to get a construction pre-qualification -quali pre letter from the Colum City of Columbus Income Tax Division. You obtain this letter from them by calling 614-645-8368. You want to make sure you ask for this specific letter because they do have another letter of understanding um, that's not the letter we want. We want the one that specifically says construction pre-qualification. This letter cannot be dated more than 30 days prior to the submission of um, your application. So basically this criteria is saying, are you current on your taxes with the City of Columbus? If you're not current on your taxes, have you set up a payment plan with them to make you compliant in filing taxes. Um, if you cannot get this letter from the Income Tax Division, you will be deemed not responsible, um, as well as saying false or not providing any the correct documentation for Category A, you will be deemed not responsible. If you've never had to deal with the City of Columbus in the Income Tax Division, they will set up an account for you and provide a letter that will suffice to say, we set up an account, as of right now, they have no filings, and it, it, it'll work just as well. Um, so your certificate or your letter of good standing issued by the state of Ohio is not what we're looking for for this criteria, so please do not submit it. This is category A. Do we have any questions before we move on to category B? What if you've never been bonded? If you've never, so for subcontractors um, who are going to only perform subcontract work, there's an exemption. Uh, if they say they're only going to do subcontractor work, then we know that they can get that bonding from, from the prime when they work the project. Um, so they would have to specific, specifically state on their application, on their little checkbox on the contact page, that they want to do subcontract work only. And I believe there's an exemption box that says uh, that they're only going to do subcontract work in category A. Let me tell you what criteria it is. Yes, on the bonding, it does say subcontract work only. They would check that box um, for, for bonding in category A, and then that would let me know that I'm not looking for any bonding documentation because we are aware that that can be obtained through the prime. On the contract or on the, we could still be a potential bidder? If you, if you want to be a potential bidder, you have to have some type of bonding or you can, Columbus has um, a bonding affidavit that you could complete as well. Um, but you, yeah, in order to be a potential bidder, you have to have some type of way to prove that you're, you're bondable. So category B is criteria 7 through 11, and this is where we actually start to accumulate points um, during the application process. Category A, um, because it's mandatory, there are no point accumulations for that, but here's where we start to, to accumulate points. You must meet any three of the five criteria in order to be uh, pre-qualified, responsible, or provisionally responsible. If you cannot meet three of the five, then you will be deemed not responsible. To meet the criteria, as in category A, you must answer the criteria true and provide the correct documentation. And again, failure to provide the correct documentation or false will mean that you will not be awarded any points for the criteria. 
So criteria seven is local workforce. Is your local workforce at least 15% of your Ohio full-time equivalent employees reside in Columbus is the question. When we say reside in Columbus, that means when we go to check the address of that employee, it says that it is physically located within the city limits of Columbus. Not Groveport, not Hilliard, not Dublin, not Westerville, but it is actually <laughs> inside the city limits of Columbus, regardless of what the mailing address says it is. The hours you would use are the hours from your previous fiscal year. And then here are ways that you can verify the addresses before you submit them to me for verification. You can either go through the Franklin County Auditor's website, and there's their uh, address, or if you go to uh, city of, the City of Columbus Income Tax Division at columbus.gov slash income tax division, they have instructions of how to submit to get address verification. Um, they have a process if it's less than 10, and then they have a process if you're submitting more than 10 um, addresses, and they will do the verification for you and send it back to you, and it will tell you exactly what address and where it's located, the addresses that you provide where they're located. So in the application packet, there's a local workforce worksheet. It asks for the employee's address, the city, the zip code, the number of hours that they worked, and if they are a construction employee or a non-construction employee. And that local workforce worksheet is in the back of the application where you'll find uh, the affidavits. So just for clarification purposes, we're going to run through um, how to do the actual uh, calculation. So for instance, um, a company has Ohio employees hours that total 40,000 hours, just some random number I picked. Um, 35,000 of those hours are for construction employees, and 5,000 of those hours are for other employees or, as it's listed in the application, non-construction employees. Through address verification, it has been determined that 10,000 construction hours are from employees that reside in Columbus, and 2,000 of those other hours are for employees that reside in Columbus. So to calculate if you meet the 15%, you would take your Ohio Construction Service, FTEs, full-time, equivalent employees, 35,000 hours divided by 1280, which is the uh, typical uh, number of hours for construction employees. Um, divide those two, you put that answer in column 1B. Then you would do the same thing for your non-construction employees. So it would be the 5,000 divided by 2080, which is the, the hours that those of us that are in the office all day or typically work a year. And then the answer that you get, that answer goes in column 1D as in David. So now you've figured out your Ohio calculations. Now you need to determine what your Columbus calculations are. So your total Ohio full-time equivalent calculation is column 1B plus column 1D, and you'll put that answer in column 1E. Now here's the Columbus calculation portion. We said in the problem above that 10,000 of the hours are from Columbus residents, 10,000 divided by 1280, this answer would go in column 2B. Same thing for your non-construction employees. The 2,000 hours divided by 2080, and this would go in column 2D as in David. So then the calculation for your total Columbus FTE, 
column 2B plus column 2D, your answer would then go in column 2E. So to figure out if you have met the 15%, column 2E divided by column 1E is, will give you an answer that you'll put in column 3A. Multiply that by 100 to get your percentage, and that'll let you know if you have 15%. It must be 15.0 whatever. Not 14.92, not 14.6. It has to be at least 14, 15 points, something else, whatever else after. If you don't have 15% uh, 15 you would mark the criteria false. Criteria 8 is quality training contract. This criteria is specific to the licensed construction trade applicants. If you do not employ licensed construction trade personnel as listed on that criteria page, there's an exemption box that says we do not employ licensed construction trades as listed in this criteria. Check that exemption box and check that exemption box only. Don't check false, it didn't go down and check the exemption box. Don't check true, it didn't go down and check the exemption box. Just check the exemption box and you will automatically get the two points, because, 10 points, because we're not gonna penalize because you're not a licensed trade. And then again, ex ex select only one option. The answer is either yes, I'm a licensed trade, and yes, based on the information listed in the criteria, my licensed trade employees have the necessary training, um, years of training. Um, or, yes, I have these type of, of employees, however, they do not, based on what's listed on the criteria, have the necessary, necessary years of training. So the answer is either true, and then you go down and you select what licensed trade you are, because they're listed, the answer is false. We still want you to tell us what licensed trade you are. Or the answer is we don't, have, we don't have such employees. And then you would just select the exemption box. Checking multiple boxes will get an email from me. Um, just so you know, I, I will definitely send this back to you and say please provide me with only one answer. Criteria nine is health insurance. And so we want to know, as a company, as a business, do you apply these benefits to your construction service employees? Again, because this is a construction pre-qualification application process. So the, the focus of this criteria is also on your uh, construction service employees. Answer the cri uh, criteria completely. Any missing information will result in no points awarded. So we ask you um, who has the policy, when was the policy in effect. Um, so we want to make sure who pays the premium. Um, we want to know all of that information and it's listed there. Please do not leave anything blank. If you receive your employees through a union, um, then we would want to know the policy dates that they have, or if that's unknown to you, um, the contract. What is the, the current year contract that, you, that the union is on? Criteria can only be answered true if the employer or the union pays part of the premium. So if the box is checked that the employee pays the entire amount of the premium, you cannot answer this question true um, based on uh, information contained in the application. Um, and it specifically explains that the employer has to pay uh, part of the premium. 
or the union. And all documentation must be current. Um, what we ask for is a letter from your union. Um, if, if you have union employees that says, this is company ABC, they you know, are currently compliant with us up and through you know, whatever the current month you're compliant. Uh, we understand that they, they're kind of like a month and a half or so behind. So an application that's submitted in June, I know might say you're current up through April. Uh, that's perfectly fine. That's just common knowledge that we know. If you don't have union employees and you are providing a benefit, then you would need to get a letter from your provider that says company ABC has you know, health insurance that they offer to all their employees. Their account um, is current. Our premiums are up to date. Um, we don't need to know who's covered. Um, so please do not submit um, your insurance premium bill with all of your employee information and the different type of coverages that they have. Um, that's not required. We just want to know um, from the health insurance company um, or whoever carries the, the insurance that you're current. Criteria 10 is retirement and pension program. And it kind of is the same way um, as we just discussed with the health insurance. Criteria only uh, is, applies to construction service employees. Answer the criteria completely. Again, if you have union workers, if you don't know the policy dates, the effective uh, dates of the contract will be fine. And then the criteria can only be answered true if the employer is um, providing um, some monies into the retirement plan. You know, whether it's a company match or you do it, at, you contribute outside of a company match, um, but there has to be some type of company monies um, from the employer that goes into the employee's retirement plan. Again, your documentation must be current. And the last criteria in category B is local business. Do you have a current and fixed local occupancy as defined in the criteria? Are you a taxpayer in good standing? Well, we will know if you're a taxpayer in good standing because you'll be able to provide the construction prequalification letter um, that you need it for criteria six. You must meet the previous two requirements in its entirety in order to check true. And again, local is defined as being within the city limits of Columbus. If you do not own the building that you are in, that your business is housed in, there's a local business affidavit that must be completed. And again, that affidavit is in the back of the application packet. And the affidavit is to be completed by the owner of the building, not the people who occupy the building. Um, if that is incorrect, you will receive an email from me to say, hey, I need for you to redo your local business affidavit because you all completed it and I need for the owner of the property to complete it. This is category B. Again, these are all worth 10 points. You need three out of the five in order to not be deemed not responsible at this point. Do we have any questions about category B? What if what if you haven't what if you haven't been in business long enough to provide all these benefits to employees? So if you're unable to provide those benefits at the time of um, prequalification, do know that you will be deemed. So let me rephrase: you any three of the five. So we don't dictate 
which three of the five. So if you have 15% um, Columbus residents, you answer the quality contracting question, and then you can come and say true to local, local business, one, two, three, three out of five. I can't tell you which three out of five you have to meet. <laughs> you just have to meet three out of five, okay? So yeah. Any other questions? Good, okay. So now we're gonna go through, and the last category is category C, which makes up the remainder of the application. And at this point, we are asking um, questions to say within the last five years, has there been any issues with these in, within these uh, criteria categories? These are five points each, and they consist of, sorry, I guess I should have clicked that so you can see that. Um, and to me, you must be able to answer true. And if it requires supporting documentation, which most of these do not, I will tell you which one requires um, additional documentation. If you say true, you must provide the documentation for that particular criteria. And again, failure to provide um, the criteria, uh, supporting documentation, uh, if it's required, or to answer the question. Um, will result in no points being awarded. So you want to make sure as you go through and before you submit your application that you've checked all of the boxes throughout your application for all the criteria. So criteria 12 is debarment. Criteria 13 is criminal conviction. Criminal conviction is the only one that's 10 years, the previous 10 years. The rest of these will be five years. Civil liability, city litigation, and that means for city litigation, has the city ever had to file a suit against you within the last five years? Regardless of, of the decision of the suit, if, if, they, if the city has, and when I say the city, I mean the city of Columbus, then you would have to check that criteria false because you, you've had it. Um, 16 is bond claims, 17 is liquidated damages, 18 is non-discrimination. So the, as I said, the criteria basically reads, um, you have not had any judgments against you within the last five years for con criminal conviction, it's 10. Um, and then you would just go down and you would just check the appropriate box, whether it's either true or false. These criteria don't require any additional supporting documentation. So the notarization of your application affidavit is telling us that you're truthfully answering these questions. Our favorite affidavit message. <laughs> so criteria 19 is socially responsible. This criteria will require additional documentation. So the additional documentation is a signed memorandum of understanding, contract, or letter from a certified apprentice program that has an ongoing contract with an employment service organization or a contract with an employment services organization that includes the following. A declaration on the part of the business that it intends to hire, retain, provide advancement opportunities to formerly incarcerated persons and or displaced workers. A commitment from the employment service organization to act as an intermediary between the business and the employees whose employment stems from, from A, which is the one above, in the event that human resource related issues arise in the business request assistance. And lastly, a thorough description of the job retention support services that the business and or the employment service organization will provide. 
and they give examples of transportation, child care, food assistance, uh, wellness benefits, housing assistance, education, and career training, mentorship and coaching, you know, financial literacy training, et cetera. So if you are a business, this criteria wants to know, do you have a relationship with another organization and that organization's purpose is to do this? Put formerly incarcerated displaced workers back into the workforce through these methods. Or if you deal with the union, does the union have a relationship with another organization that does this? So having union uh, employees isn't enough. The union itself would have to have this outside relationship. Um, or you, as uh, the business, would need to have this outside relationship. Okay, and then that organization would provide a letter stating that they have this relationship with you and what they do um, and what their organization is all about um, in, in, in a short letter. Was there, did you have any questions about, yes? Is there any consequences with uh, not having that uh, on the category, on the criteria 19? Is there like so the question is, is there any consequences for not, for saying false to criteria 19? There is no consequences because at this point, the remainder of the application is trying to accumulate enough points to be deemed either responsible or provisionally responsible. So your category A was must meet all six. Your category B is three out of five. And then category C is can I get, do I get the points necessary to be deemed responsible or pr provisionally responsible? So it's either you get the points or you don't get the points at this point. Um, in no way, shape, or form does it have any, you know, impact. We don't look at it a certain way because this is a criteria that you said false to. Okay, so. That last part. Yeah, so if, you, if you're able to say true to the socially responsible, then you would just provide us a letter from that outside organization, five points. If you, if you don't, check false, you get zero points. Um, yeah, it, we're, not, we're not basing, you know, nobody's coming through and saying when you put in the bid, oh, did they mark socially responsible? No, nobody, no one's coming through and doing that. If, if that's what you're, if that, if that was the, the concern. No, no, that is not happening. <laughs> Any additional questions? Okay, so the remainder of category C, criteria is 20A through 20J. Again, uh, this is gonna be the, the previous five years and it's always five years from the date of receipt of the application. Everything that's time sensitive is always from the date that your application is received in the office. Not the date that you completed it, but the date that it actually hits our inbox. And so the points are awarded as follow for the remainder uh, re, uh, for 20A through 20J. If you have zero to one incidents or violation, you get the full 10 points. Two to four, you get five points. Five or more, you get zero points. Again, to meet the criteria, you must be able to answer the criteria true. And for those criteria that require additional documentation, provide that documentation. And again, failure to provide the correct documentation will result in not receiving any points for the criteria. Criteria 20A is labor standards. 20B is prevailing wage. Criteria 20C is unemployment compensation. Um, I do want to point out for a prevailing wage, we do contact the state of Ohio um, to see if, you, if there's been any complaints and any determinations. Um, so please be aware of that. These 
criteria do not require additional supporting documentation. So you'll have the notarized application affidavit. Our little affidavit note. Criteria 20D is workers' compensation. And so what you need to submit is your coverage history from the Bureau of Workers' Compensation. And your coverage history will read like the list. And it will say, when you first applied for your, your BWC certificate, it'll give the year. If you made all of your payments and filings on time, that's the only thing that you'll see. If you've had any lapse in payments, which means you didn't make your payments on time, then you'll see lapsed and it'll give a, a date range. And then it'll say reinstated, and it gives a date range. If you lapse again, it'll say lapsed, it'll give a date range. And then once everything is caught up, it'll say reinstated and give a date range. We're looking to see how many times in the last five years that the word lapsed appears on your coverage history. And again, it's from the last five years. If you see lapsed anywhere within the last five years from the date of your application submission, please check the criteria false. Again, I'm not looking for your BWC certificate. You've already given me that at the beginning. I'm looking for your actual coverage history. Um, if you have problems finding your coverage history, the best place the best people to contact would be the state of Ohio um, and the Department of Workers' Compensation. They'll be able to direct you how to find it in your account, or they'll be able to email one to you. And I will take an email from, a work, from someone who works for the state of Ohio. Um, that's become more common because people are working virtually. So I, that is acceptable as well. 20E is OSHA unsatisfactory judgments. Violations reviewed are those that are, cons that are listed as willful or serious. We don't count the ones that say other. We're just looking for willful and serious. List all OSHA and OSHA approved state plan violations. And if you are a large organization that has many locations, we look at the entire company, regardless of where the company is located, regardless of where you do your project. Um, do note, I do go out to the OSHA website to, to verify. Okay, so if, if there's any willful, any serious, each one is counted as a violation. So if you have multiple serious and willfuls that have not been deleted through appeal, because I can see that as well, then each one is counted. Um, more than five, you will receive zero points for the criteria. Same goes with OSHA penalties. The penalties are counted even if there are no corresponding violations. So we do know that there is no serious or, or willful um, most of the time, some of them are labeled other, but then there's a penalty assessment. That penalty assessment will be counted, although the other was not counted for the prior criteria. Again, list all OSHA and OSHA approved state plan penalty assessments. And again, we look at the entire company, regardless of location of the offices and where the projects are located. Criteria 20G through 20J. Licenses is 20G. Worker classification, 20H. Worker identification, 20I. 20J is EPA. Again, there's no additional supporting documentation. Um, the notarized Application affidavit.
criteria 20K through 20L are three points each, and then criteria 20N is two points. Again, to meet these, you must be able to say true, and if necessary, submit supporting documentation. And then failure to complete any uh, information will be false and no points will be awarded. 20K is OSHA plan. Do you have one? 20L OSHA log. Do you keep one or are you required to keep one? 20N. Is it a drug-free workplace? The affidavit, application affidavit. Criteria 20M is your experience modification rating or EMR as it's normally listed. This is two points. What we want is your current experience modification rating from the State of Ohio Bureau Bureau of Workers' Compensation, or a letter from your third, a third party providing the current EMR if you're self-insured. Okay? Do we have any questions? Because that is, is the application. Um, and now we're going to talk about the, the status determination process. Okay. So, after I review and I see that yes, they have the supporting documentation that's required, I've given you the points where you've accumulated the points. Now I have to determine if you're pre-qualified responsible, pre-qualified provisionally responsible, or deemed not responsible. Okay? So in order to be Pre-qualified responsible, you have to have at least 151 points. 200 points is the max. Um, so you have to have at least 151 points. To be pre-qualified responsible, you have to have at least 131 points all the way through to 150 points. Pre-qualified, not responsible, 130 points or less. I will say for pre-qualified, not responsible, it's normally not due to points. It's due to either not being able to say true to everything in category A and or not meeting three of the five in category B. Um, all of the time I've seen applicants meet point requirements. Um, so not responsible is normally for the, that reason, not meeting all of criteria A and or not meeting three of the five in category B. So how will you be notified of your status determination and when will you be notified? Um, we ask that you allow 30 calendar days from the date of receipt of your application to process the application. All applicants will be notified via email regarding their status determination. Um, if there are any issues with the application, I can't read something, something's faded, um, a page is missing because it didn't scan all the way through, that notification will all come via email, which is why I stated that it's important that the contact person that you list in the application is the person who answers emails. Um, if you know that one of your employees only checks emails once a week, that's not the best person um, to put down. And emails will only be sent to the contact person listed in the application. Your notification will include a status determination letter which says, um, it'll have your company name, your EIN, and it will tell you what status you have been deemed, either responsible, provisionally responsible, or not responsible. The scoring matrix to see where you got points and where you didn't. Um, and then it'll have your, your point total for you. 
and then your certificate of responsibility. The certificate of responsibility is only issued to responsible and provisionally responsible applicants. Um, once you've been deemed that status, your certificate will give your status determination date. It'll include your renewal period. It will have your EIN, of course your name. If you are considered a potential bidder or chose to do subcontract work only, and then your expiration date for your status determination. When does your status determination expire? 24 consecutive months immediately following the date of your status determination. All potential bidders or licensed construction trade subcontractors deemed provisionally responsible must be deemed responsible within 24 consecutive months following the date of the original status determination. All bidders or licensed construction trade subcontractors deemed not responsible must be deemed responsible within 12 consecutive months following the date of the original status determination. So if you're deemed not responsible, we're giving you a year to fix that. Um, versus giving you two years and not be able to bid on any projects. So if you're deemed not responsible, you have 12 months to, to change that status. Changing your status determination to responsible. You have two opportunities to seek a change in status when you have enough supporting documentation to do so in categories where no points or partial points were given. Submit additional documentation to the Office of Construction Pre-Qualification to meet additional criteria. And then your supporting documentation must be accompanied by a memo on company letterhead that identifies the documentation being submitted as well as the pre-qualification criteria for the documentation and a signed letter, and it needs to be signed by an authorized officer of the company. What happens if you're not deemed responsible during your status determination period? It won't affect any work that you're currently performing for the city. So once the contract has been awarded to you, that will not be impacted um, if you're not uh, deemed responsible during your status determination period. Um, an application for pre-qualification can be submitted once your current status determination expires. And you will not receive any new city construction work or perform any portion of work on any new construction service project until you apply for responsibility for pre-qualification and are determined to be pre-qualified responsible. So you're not going to be able to sneak on a project as a subcontractor um, is basically what that, that last part is saying. So there's going to be a lapse between, because you can't fill out an application to be pre-qualified until after your qualification has expired. Correct. That's if you don't follow, that's if you were not deemed. So this is for someone who was deemed like provisionally responsible. Okay. So now we're going to talk about how, what we do for renewing. How do I renew my pre-qualification? Um, again, pre-qualification must be renewed biannually. Renewal applications must be submitted 30 calendar days prior to the expiration date of the current pre-qualification status and will not be accepted more than 45, day, 45 calendar days prior to the expiration date. It is the sole responsibility of the business entity to maintain its pre-qualification status and to submit a renewal application in a timely manner to avoid expiration. Um, applicants, in order to be part of the renewal process, applicants must be deemed responsible 30 calendar days prior to the expiration date to renew their status. So this is 
particular to provisionally responsible um, applicants to pay attention to that in order to be deemed a renewal, you should have um, gotten a change in status 30 days prior. Mm -hmm. Happens when you are say less than more than 30 or less than 30 days prior to expiration. Uh, are there consequences or something like that? You want to go to the next slide and see? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> If it's not the next slide, it is the, the slide after. But the question is, what is the consequence for not meeting um, the 30-day the submission? That's your question. OK. What happens if I did not submit my renewal application on time? So here's a scenario. Your status determination, June 30th, 2022. I know that's not here yet. <laughs> <laughs> Your status expiration would then be July 1st, 2024. Your renewal period will, will begin on May 17th, 2024 at 45 calendar days all the way through June 1st, 2024, which is the 30 calendar days that it must be in. If a application is not received during the renewal period, Earliest an application can be submitted is June 2nd, 2024. So what happens if you don't meet, don't submit within the renewal uh, period? Your status has to expire before you can submit a new application. You can't submit it on your expiration date. You have to wait till that lapses, and it lapses at 11.59, 59, and 59 seconds on that day, p.m. Eastern time. The, the earliest you would be able to submit a new application would be the next day, July 2nd. Okay? So, so you said do the whole process over again? So there's only one application? <laughs> so there's not like an, a, Currently, there's no amended version of the application. So yes, it would be once you do the application, and if I've told you what is wrong with your application, you fix those. Once you have a good application, as far as supporting documentations, keep that for, for future references. Um, it, it will help you along the way, especially um, in companies where there's you know, high turnover in, in the office. You always want to have that, you know, look at this. This is what it's supposed to look like, and this will get us through, through every time. So, yeah, there's only, there's only one application where you're just going to click the boxes and print off the supporting documentation. It used to be every year. Now it's biannually, so every other year. So that's a little breather. Um, but, yeah, it's just the, the, the one application. Things to remember. Still submit your application during the application renewal period. Double check your application to ensure all questions have been answered and all supporting documentation is attached. Again, make your application contact person the person who responds to the office in a timely manner with any questions or concerns we may have regarding your application. This person will only communicate with the contact person. I wouldn't say only communicate if someone else does contact the office. We will answer their question, but any, any correspondence that comes from the Office of Construction Prequalification will be sent directly to the contact person in the application. Um, but no, we do not ignore emails of someone else from the office, emails and ask us a question. Uh, submit the supporting documentation as requested on page two of the application. So in the application packet on page two, it goes over what criteria number requires supporting documentation and what that supporting documentation is as we discussed during the presentation. Redact conf confidential information from supporting documentation. Um, I ask that you do not send employees' full names, definitely not their social security numbers, um, anything that personally identifies 
any of your employees, please refrain from sending any of that type of information um, with your application submission. That way, um, if I do have to go through and redact that I'm not missing something. So we just ask for you not to send it because it's not required um, for any reason whatsoever. Allow 30 days for your application to be processed. Things to remember of the don'ts. Do not send your application or any information requested in the office in a zip file. Um, I have a hard time um, opening those. I have to send them out to get it unzipped and sent back. Um, send it as a PDF attachment. If it has to be, you know, two PDF attachments, that's fine. The application being one, the supporting documentation being the second attachment. Um, I ask that you not send more than two um, PDF attachments, but if you have to, I've had people who've sent three. Um, but if possible, if you have to send more than one, I would say put the application and all the affidavits in one email and then your supporting documentation um, as another uh, PDF attachment. So we can't put one email, one PDF per supporting document? I would prefer that you didn't, um, but, but people have. So I'm not going to say that you can't. Um, it's, yeah, so, I, so I'll say this. As long as it's not zipped, I'm OK. okay. Um, my preference, I'm strictly stating my preference, which is easier for me, but I do have the ability to combine um, the PDFs into one document. Um, so if you have to send them, and it, and it has been done, I'm not going to say it hasn't. But if you have to, to, to attach them one by one by one uh, because of your system, that's perfectly fine. Just double check to make sure that you've attached all the ones that you need to attach. And I'm not going to send it back to you. I'm, I'm going to take it. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> right. Not a problem. I've, I've seen it a few times. Do not submit your application multiple times. You will know that I received your application because I will send you an email that says, I received your application, company ABC, I received your application, this is the date I received your application, please allow 30 days for me to process your application, you have seven business days to make any changes to your application. Call me if you have any questions. Um, it's not an automatic bounce back email, it will, it, so you won't get it immediately, I say allow, um, a business day or two um, to get that email back. If you don't receive it in two business days, call or send an email um, just to make sure that it is not overlooked um, in the inbox somewhere. Um, please don't wait 30 days. <laughs> Do not. If you haven't received anything, um, unless you get a bounce back email that says I'm out of the office and then it won't be completed until I get back. But if you don't get that um, out of office reply, um, if you don't receive an uh, email receipt in two business days, then contact the office, please. Um, our favorite um, affidavit notification. Um, do not handwrite on the applications. It is a PDF fill-in form where you can click the boxes and, and type um, I worked very hard to, to make that possible. So just click, click, type, tab, click, type, type, all of the boxes um, should work. If for any reason, though, one of the check boxes won't check for you, then yes, a hand X mark on the page will, will suffice. Um, but they all should, should work correctly. Again, do not select more than one checkbox for each criteria. So here is the important contact information. Again, I'm with the Office of Construction Prequalification. We're located at 77 North Front Street, 5th floor, Columbus, 43215. You can call at 614-645-0359, or you can fax 614-645. 5818. Our email address is prequalification at columbus.gov. 
Our website is columbus.gov slash prequalification dot A S P X. To obtain your construction prequalification letter from the City of Columbus Income Tax Division, you can give them a call at 614-645-8368. And if for any reason you wouldn't need to fax them, it is 614-724-0232. And then their website is columbus.gov slash income tax division. And then if you need to obtain your contract compliance, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, phone number 614-645-4764. And their website is columbus.gov slash ODI. Any final questions? Yes. Uh, even though your slides that allow 30 days for processing, is there kind of like an average that you would say takes to get an application process? It depends on the time of year. So if we're looking at um, your September, your October, your November, those tend to be a little heavier, um, as well as uh, February, March, April. June, July, August. Not so much. Um, those just tend to be slower. So the, when the months are heavier, it normally takes um, 30 days since I'm the person processing, um, you know, looking through all of them, processing them. It will take me um, that, um, that amount of time um, in the months where the bids aren't going out as, as heavy and ap uh, applications aren't coming in. Um, they're normally done with before 30 days, kind of more like a two and a half to three week mark. Mm -hmm. Yes? An application window, or is this any time to do the calendar year? Um, we take applications all year round. Yep, so anytime. And I would say if you're first time starting out, um, of course get your application in as soon as, as, soon as you know you, as possible. So you can be ready to, to bid. Um, but basically, you determine your expiration based on when you submit your application, if that makes sense. So you know, if you're a company that shuts down during the holidays in December, that might not be a good time to want to have a renewal period, because you're going to have to rely on somebody to submit that application during the renewal period. And if you miss your renewal period, then you're sitting out waiting until your status expires. Um, but yes, we take applications all year round on a continuous basis. Okay, well, I thank you all for joining me this morning. Hopefully you've learned a lot. Um, again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at prequalification at columbus.gov or call 614-645-0359. Thank you.